Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. Think of what your goal is and then try to think of a few things you could do to get closer to it, you know, and maybe closer to it in five months. And then in five months, try to think of something to get a little closer to that. You carry around these thoughts and these ideas that you're this person. And then, you know, at some point you have to prove it to yourself and actually make the rest of the world see it. Okay, testing one, two, three. Are we rolling? Yeah. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of In the Envelope. Um, Jamie, are you there? How are you? Hello, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. You sound uh, wonderful, as always. How's the studio? <laughs> oh, the studio is just the same. <laughs> it's my little yes. uh, sort of upright coffin of doom, but it sounds good. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> it's an upright coffin that sounds great. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I'm excited for today's episode, another uh, deep dive into the voiceover industry. So of course, I wanted to ask you about, you know, what's going on in voiceover in general, what's going on in voiceover today, post pandemic. And um, I know we've both just listened to both of today's interviews. So what, what's the deal? What can you tell us? Well, uh, firstly, it's nice to talk about something I actually know about for a change. <laughs> Usually I'm just <laughs> sure. totally winging these banters. Um, but yeah, the voiceover industry is one of the few areas of the entertainment industry that is actually carrying on throughout this crisis, um, shut down yes. or no shutdown. And it has changed, of course. Certain genres are able to be more productive than others. Um, certain mm. other genres are having to adapt. So, for example, video games, where they would have classically had talent come into studios are now adapting to working with talent who have home studios and they have to Uh be up to a certain standard of course but uh, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's the same for commercial work and stuff like that but other genres of voiceover uh, have been somewhat unaffected because they tend to be focused around talent who have home studios and record from home anyway so that hasn't really needed to change all that much so uh, there's right. some change, and then in certain areas, there, there isn't so much change. And it's true that um, since the pandemic, a lot more actors have set up home studios themselves, yes. um, including a couple of the guests on this podcast. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's not... It's it depe- doable. It's doable. It depends a little yeah. bit on a number of factors that are out of your control in terms of now, like where you live. If you live under a flight path, (laughs) it's not super easy to, you know, next to a big busy street or something. Mm. That's not so easy. But if you're relatively in a relatively quiet space, actually creating an environment that sounds good is not too Mm -hmm. challenging. What's difficult is keeping sound interruptions out, which is where it becomes expensive and confusing. But yeah, in terms of the technology, you don't have to spend a ton of money to get your home studio sounding pretty good. And, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to make it happen either. So, yeah, we have these deep dive podcast episodes into the voice, into the world of voiceover and listeners, the voices you heard at the beginning of this interview. And for those who are joining us, because you are a Bob's Burgers fan, welcome uh, Eugene Merman and John Roberts are, there's a bus, there's a bus going, <laughs> going by my house. Should I start over? <laughs> uh, it's real. It's the real world. We could keep it. Yeah. Could you hear that? Yeah, I could a little bit. Well, so my home studio needs work then. Okay, great. Well, now we know. You're a little bit echoey if I was to be picky oh, about crap. it. crap. <laughs> well, I'm surrounded as, with as much, it's still a, it's padded, but it is in a bigger room because I can't go in my closet. It's, it's crappy internet connection. Anyway, um, Bob's Burgers, Eugene Merman, who plays Gene, and John Roberts, who plays Linda Belcher, uh, are joining us today. And they talk to, they speak to a lot of what you were just talking about, Jamie, don't they? They um, Mm -hmm. have their home studios. Their jobs are mostly unaffected. Bob's Burgers will continue, which I found fascinating. Yeah. 
Well, the interesting thing about Bob's Burgers specifically is that a lot of the stuff they're recording now doesn't have to necessarily sound amazing because it's mm. prelay for the animators. So when this yeah. is all said and done, they could always go back into the studio and replace what they've done at mm -hmm. home. Right. And the other thing about Bob's Burgers is there is a decent amount of improvisation. Yeah. Um, it's a great example of a show that was kind of crafted around the actors playing the characters and... Um, while a lot of it is scripted by the brilliant Lauren Bouchard and, uh, and his team of writers, people like John Roberts and Eugene Merman do a lot of like improvising. And that's true of like, that's part of the ADR process. So we heard all about that. We're going to hear from Eugene first and then John. Yeah. And um, yeah, is there anything else we need to brief listeners on before we get to it? I'd like to plug something if that's okay. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> um, so I have my podcast, VO School, which is all about mm -hmm. voiceover. Um, it's a sort of sister podcast to In the Envelope. And um, each episode is, up until episode 50, was devoted to a different subject <laughs> each time. And mm -hmm. now we've switched it around a bit because we're sort of running out of subjects. <laughs> and it's becoming a bit more of a roundtable discussion about what's going on. And the final thing, which you'll hear about in a few seconds, is... Yesterday, uh, we released tickets, hmm. which is what June fifteenth, uh, oh, right now. Right. Whenever you're listening to this, um, yes. for our virtual conference, Vocation, which is all about the business of voiceover. So we don't have any performance classes or anything like that, but uh, it's all about how to run and start your voiceover business, and you know, branding, marketing, casting, working with agents, managers, all mm. that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Networking, the whole thing. We've got some amazing guests joining us so if you're interested in that kind of stuff you can just go to our website vocationconference.com amazing and remind uh remind me when is this conference it is in september 11th through the 13th and it's 100 virtual it is yeah we held it last year at symphony space in new york mm -hmm. and uh we would have loved to do it there again this year mm -hmm. but for obvious reasons that's not happening um but uh, i think this will be not quite the same, but, you know, as good as we can make it in oh, the sort sure. of virtual world. Yes. Yeah, so listeners looking to get into the real businessy, really deep dive into voiceover, maybe you're visiting it for the first time or you're a pro, listen to In the Envelope episodes featuring Raphael, Bob Waxberg, and these guys and all yes. of our other voiceover deep dives. Definitely listen to the VO School. It's your crash course in getting involved in voiceover industry. And um, yes, sign up for this conference. Tickets are, um, I guess, available now. They are now. Yeah. As of recording, <laughs> no. But when this comes out on Thursday, right. they will be. Uh, and that's yeah. Yeah, vocationconference.com. Okay, great. So um, let's get to these two fantastic interviews. First, Eugene and then John. Jamie, thank you for all the work you're doing on this podcast. And thank you for joining me. My pleasure. Thank you for asking me. The voiceover business is more than just acting. It's a business. Voice actors are auditioning, negotiating, engineering, branding, connecting to sessions from home, and doing thousands of things every day to put them in the best position to succeed. So how do you learn about the business of the voiceover business? That part is easy. The Vocation Conference Online, eVocation. September 11th through the 13th, join experts in the voiceover industry for classes, talks, panels, and forums on the business of the business. For more information and tickets, visit vocationconference.com. Eugene Merman is best known as the voice of Gene Belcher on Fox's Emmy Award-winning animated comedy Bob's Burgers, and for his work on Aqua Teen Hunger Force, Flight of the Concords, Delocated, Archer, and more. The Russian-born writer-actor-comedian's new documentary, It Started as a Joke, highlights the alternative stand-up comedy he has helped turn into a movement. Here's our deep dive with Eugene Merman. We are so delighted to have you, particularly given, I mean, obviously I wish that this were an in-person interview, but I'm so pleased you're, you're set up. I assume you've recorded plenty of like podcast interviews before and after this crisis. Uh, yes. I mean, I've, I've recorded before and during. I haven't done any after. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no such thing as after. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. I actually, I'd love to hear about what's going on with Bob's Burgers is up and running pretty much per normal, right? You just don't have a commute into a studio? 
I, you know, I don't know. So we've recorded ADR, which is uh, additional dialogue recording. So there have been some episodes where we've recorded a handful of lines um, that are going to air. But in general, we record the audio, you know, sort of nine to 12 months out before it airs. So mm -hmm. most of what we've recorded this year is actually for next year, except for when we're recording, um, you know, lines that are uh, need to be swapped out that are going to be used in an upcoming episode. Wow, um, okay. So they've had us record an episode, you know, but I think potentially to be re-recorded in a studio, uh, you know, so, so I don't know. I mean, obviously, <laughs> like, I know that the writing can get done. They're doing meetings. But I actually, I actually don't really have the answers to to those questions. Other than mm -hmm. I know they're able to let us do a small amount of recording at home, and maybe record episodes like sort of as scratch tracks to animate to. I I, I don't know for mm -hmm. sure. And it's it's so far in advance that you guys are maybe just set for a while. That's interesting. Yeah, and I think like if there's a moment where it's safe to go into a studio, maybe we would go in and re-record stuff. I just you know. I don't, I like anybody else. I don't know. Sure. That seems like that's the, that's the running theme. I've certainly, we've recorded a lot of interviews for this podcast and I don't know, seems to be the, the common refrain. Yeah. I think like, you know, writers can write and animators and audio editors, I think can work hmm. on their own at home and then kind of bring things together. So I think it is one of the things that can right. continue being made, but again, in this sort of new way. And, in, and yeah, and the other aspect of this is in theory, uh, voiceover actors and anyone who has access to maybe a pillow fort and a microphone can be recording stuff now too. And I, I would love to ask you about your foray into voiceover and how you got into it in the first place, because we are backstage, we're very geared toward advice. And I'd mm -hmm. love to ask you as, a, as an amazing voiceover actor, like, all kinds of I have all quite kinds of questions for you about voiceover advice. But sure. um, what what do you, what advice do you have for artists in general in this time in this time of quarantine? Like, what are you doing to kind of stay engaged or stay inspired? What is your routine like? You know, what what can you uh, what should we know? Well, well. So in terms of how I got into voiceover, it's really and and I think many of the people I know and and it's true for much of the cast of Bob's Burgers is it's really stand up comedy. You know, we were all comedians mm -hmm. who, you know, sort of Lauren Bouchard, you know, met and liked, and he he sort of cast each of us for the different roles and then developed the show sort of with us in mind. Gotcha. Um, and I think in general, he sort of talks about you know, for when you're creating something to sort of think of who you'd like and, you know, sort of try to cast them. Yeah. So in terms of like voice acting, you know, for me, everything sort of has been through the prism of stand up. So, you know, I wrote a book years ago and that was also sort of because I was a comic and then I started writing this, mm -hmm. I think, like blog for the Village Voice. And out of that, you know, eventually came a book. And now, you know, sometimes I'm people, you know, ask to cast me in something. There's there's some cartoons that I've auditioned for. And then, you know, sort of like two years later, I find out that it is a show and they would like me to come in and record more. So you never, okay. you never know, sort of. So that's the answer to sort of how I got into voiceover, which was really that I did something with, I was on home movies with that Lauren and Brendan Small created. And then later mm -hmm. a show that Lauren did called Lucy, Daughter of the Devil. And is it often, so, is it really that too, is, it's often two years after an audition that you hear back. I would say, well, you know what? It's what's funny is I say that, but it's my, that's only because I, I and I might be wrong. It might've been about a year. There's a show I'm on and I think it was sort of a very, very long time, maybe a year or two between doing something and then, or maybe I came in and did a pilot and then two years later it was something. I mean, I know that we worked on Bob's for several years as like an eight minute demo um, mm -hmm. so, so, so yeah, I, I don't know what, I don't do so much of this that I could tell you what's normal. You, you know, I could only sure, sort sure, of sure. say what I've experienced, which, which is maybe normal, maybe not. I mean, other times you get a request to do something and it's, you're recording the next day. Um, mm. but that's because they just have you in mind for a role, but you know, I don't, um, in a sense do so much of it. But it's because Lauren was familiar with your work, and I assume your your kind of com comedy and comedic sensibilities, but also your voice that he was interested. Yes, 
Yes, I think that that is true. I mean, my advice to people in general would be to make things, you know, um, mm -hmm. like I would say that if you would like to be a voice actor, you know, either write something or find a, a friend that's a writer and try to make like a three minute demo of some sort, you know. Amazing. So, so I would say basically think of what your goal is and then try to think of a few things you could do to get closer to it, you know, and maybe closer to it in five months. And then mm -hmm. in five months, try to think of something to get a little closer to that. I, I don't, you know, for me, everything went through the prism of stand up comedy. So I don't really know mm -hmm. like how you would normally do stuff, n n nor do I even know that, you know, that's a normal path in stand up, though I know a lot of comedians who obviously act. Sure, sure. And we are sort of, I don't know if you would agree with this, but I think we're living in like this kind of golden age of animation where actors who are not necessarily voice actors can definitely get involved in that side of things, especially as you say, the, the comedy world. It seems really connected to comedy. Yes. I mean, anyone can get involved in anything. And I think the great thing about sort of where technology is, is you can now record pretty good quality. I think there's software to help you animate that exists in the world. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's very easy to get essentially ways to, you know, make either do either video or audio or animation. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, th that part bodes well. Totally. Anybody can do anything. That's yes. That is excellent advice. I mean, technically, yeah. <laughs> which, <laughs> yes. which is really helpful because 20 years ago, you know, like it was not, no. you, you couldn't like, I couldn't edit video at home, you yeah, know, or, yeah. or maybe actually, yeah, I think I, in fact, I think like I put videos online in sort of maybe the late nineties. And that was like, I think at work, I had some computer and I can't even remember how I, how I did it, to be honest. Right. Oh, that's right. I couldn't edit. I just okay. realized I couldn't edit and I would like sort of do in-camera edits. Like I would pause it. I would like make videos by pausing them <laughs> and stuff. Yes. Anyway. Totally. Take us back to the very beginning. Was was comedy always the goal? How did you, um, was there ever like an initial bug that bit you or how was there a light bulb that went off? Yeah. I mean, when I was in sort of junior high and even elementary school and high school, I loved stand-up comedy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would watch tons of stand-up comedy. And I think at some point when I was in hi high school, essentially, I realized that that um, that was a type of job that some people had. Okay. And I, you know, I would do sort of like I wrote, did like plays for the school play festival with, with friends. And then I... Um, would do videos and stuff like that. And, you know, where I would like, there was like, I would edit sort of in school um, or in the basement of this church, there was like a drop-in center that I worked at and they had like editing equipment in a TV studio, like a, like a sort of like um, community basically access studio. And then I, but I then realized that stand up was something. And so the summer after college, uh, the summer after high school, I tried stand up and then I really wanted to do it. And I went to a college where you could design your own major. So I right. majored in comedy um, <laughs> and did a lot of, you know, I took writing classes and acting classes and, you know, history and film classes and all sorts of wow. things. And then did a one hour stand up act as my thesis. And then also did like, you know, I had a radio show and I wrote like a column for the school paper. Like I did a lot of things mm -hmm. that all related to comedy, but were different. Was there ever a, a plan B if you, if you weren't getting into comedy, did you dream about anything else? I didn't really dream about anything else and I didn't really have a plan B. I think it was more that, you know, I didn't know w w what, what it would mean. Like maybe I would do comedy, but maybe I would write funny copy at some company or maybe mm -hmm. you know, it would be a writer for a show or maybe, you know, stand up. You know, I, I think like, I just knew that I wanted to do comedy, but I didn't really know what form it would take in a professional mm -hmm. career. And where did this take you after college? It's, it seems like you worked at comedy clubs all over the country. Where, where were you based primarily? Well, I, uh, I'm from, I went to, so went to Hampshire college and then I moved to Boston, uh, to, well, to Somerville and did comedy at the comedy studio, which was a club in Cambridge and now in Somerville. Um, and I did comedy there for, for several years before 
through that, I got into the Aspen Comedy Festival and then also on did a set on Conan and um, and then uh, moved to New York City to do comedy. And, cool. and, and But also like a lot of like, you know, I made a website where I put videos on it and I had a little, uh, it was like a picture of me from when I was like three years old in Russia singing classic rock uh-huh. songs. <laughs> and that sort of went around the internet virally oh, okay. to a degree. And so, you know, I was sort of trying to do a lot of different things to just have a career of some sort. Did, did you think of it as building a brand or just kind of putting yourself out there? I, I thought of, I, yeah, I, did, I don't think I was like <laughs> building a brand in 1998. But um, right, right. I was just trying to become a professional comedian with anything that I could do. So I had I couldn't put myself on television because of other people running television, <laughs> but I could make a funny thing on the internet and hope that people passed it around. Totally. Um, and I remember, I think in 2000 or 2001, maybe in 2001, I got an email from Pete Townsend of The Who, <laughs> who had yeah. seen my website and seen like, the my little baby picture singing like a who medley and linked <laughs> okay. it on his site and and it when i was i was sort of blown away um and couldn't believe that he had seen it um but yeah i wasn't i don't think there was any idea of building a brand i think there was like what can i do for people to potentially like my comedy and come and see me perform is that how you got into um opening comedy stand-up opening for uh bands for musicians yes um I With used Pete to Townsend. do well. Pete, I never opened for Pete Townsend, but oh, okay. <laughs> gotcha. I, I sorry, Pete Townsend simply said he liked my website, um, which is yeah, which which validated. is great. He never was like, "Would you like to open for the Who?" Which I imagine would be <laughs> a both uh, terrible and warm experience. Um, sure, <laughs> uh, like it'd be nice to be asked, but horrible to have done it. Uh, there's a comic who did it in in London, and I think it didn't go well. Anyway. Ah, um, okay. Yeah, so I used to do, well, I did lots of shows in New York, and there was an agent uh, who was my agent for a long time, was really great, Robin Taylor, and she saw me at at this show, Tinkle, um, that David Cross and Todd Berry and John Benjamin used to do in the Lower East Side, and she asked me if I wanted to open for The Shins, and I said yes, because, you know, uh, it, again, seemed both hard, but a great opportunity, Yeah, and I did that, and then she, you know, sort of, Uh, offered to book me. And so I then did a tour with Modest Mouse. But then also there were parallel things like Yola Tango would do these Hanukkah shows and they had Mm. comedians, you know, that they would have on those shows. And I did a bunch of those. Mm. And so I think like, you know, in general, there was a sort of um, mixing of music and comedy in, in New York, certainly. And then, you know, it kind of went out from there and probably in LA as well. How interesting. Yeah. And it, is it safe to say a lot of this is is because you had consolidated all of your work on that website? Like, how important was the website in all of this? I mean, the website was a way that people got to know me. I have no idea how important it was. It wasn't like I consolidated all my work. It's that I just sort of did what I could to uh-huh. sort of be out in the world. Um, but I think, like, certainly more people knew me from that website than they knew me from my, like, two appearances on television, you know? Okay. Um, So that, so like, you know, I think at one point, that point was probably 1976. If you appeared on The Tonight Show, you could become a household name. But I think by 2000, Mm -hmm. if you appeared on television, you were one of thousands of people who appear on television. And it's certainly validating and, and, and great and helpful. And, you know, but, but it, you know, it isn't enough for people to come see you perform really it's it's just a really good thing so yeah i I forget the beginnings of the question but the answer was the website was helpful (laughs) but it's no one thing it's sort of everything you do together sure sure it's all kind of building blocks yeah i feel like especially in the world of comedy it takes a lot it takes a very multi-varied approach maybe yeah well i mean at some point you're just trying to do any of anything i think that for me i was trying to do anything i could to sort of work in comedy. And sometimes it meant you write something, you know, every week or two for one, for a website. And sometimes you, you know, do another thing or you make videos and, you know, um, there's all sorts of stuff. Kind of increasing your odds of finding success of, and of finding collaborators too, of course. Yes, I agree. That's, that's why I think if you find people, you know, if what you want to do is voiceover and you don't think you're a great writer, 
there's probably someone who's a writer who would love, you know, a break and to do, you know, somebody to perform their, their scenes. Mm -hmm. There's probably an animator who would love to be an animator, but needs actors and and writers. So, Mm -hmm. so I think the truth is you have to find, you know, like-minded people to collaborate with, which in the world of standup, was something that was very available where you would see people who made you laugh and you would tour together and work together and, you know, collaborate. Totally. I always think of comedy as like the personal and the professional are, it's a bit of a gray area, right? There's a lot of overlap. Yes. Meaning you, you become friends with the people you travel across the country Mm -hmm. with Mm -hmm. and, and spend hours with. Yeah. Totally. And you choose people that you like to do that. Right. And you kind of gravitate towards, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you've also done a lot of, you've hosted a lot of festivals. You've, you've hosted just a lot of comedy-oriented things. I know that the Eugene Merman Comedy Festival, which was started as a joke, included so many of the greats. I'm wondering if you have advice for, like, what's the key to a good hosting of an event like that or a comedy festival or a stand-up open mic night? I mean, those are, it's a wide range. Like... What's the key to a festival and what's the key? I mean, I, I actually, maybe it's not. I would say make make it fun. You know, I, I think it depends. So like a festival, you know, I would say collaborators, you know, think of things to make it fun for audience and performers, you know, and for you. Um, open mic night, you know, it's hard to say. You know, there's an open mic night. I mean, again, everything's on pause. But yeah. in Somerville, Massachusetts, at the Comedy Studio on Tuesdays, there's something called Comedy Hell. And it's comics doing three minutes and often 60 comics doing three minutes. And it's pretty fun. You know, it's pretty fast and fun. And if somebody is, you know, not doing great, it's fine. It, it moves on quickly. And if somebody is, that's it's, you know, it's nice. Yeah. Um so I would say, you know, I, I don't I don't know. Like I haven't, you know, all the shows that I've ever done really have been even when I sort of first started where like, you know, maybe a friend would book it or, or somehow we would, you would collaborate and you would try to make the show not too long and pretty fun, you know, <laughs> like try to not have 10 comics if you can, um, or try to have 60 over three minutes, like meaning like try to make it a thing that your friends would enjoy going to. <laughs> like right. sometimes shows are just like, no one wants to go to a two and a half hour show full of people who are hit or miss, but people would actually go to a, you know, an hour and 20 minute show of six people that are hit or miss, you know, especially if it's kind of fun and like it's sociable. I mean, now people would do whatever because we've been (laughs) trapped, um, you know, once Uh, it's safe, but, (laughs) but, you know, I, I would say the main thing is, is make it enjoyable, um, and try to make it good. Like try to make it a thing you would enjoy watching that you yourself would enjoy. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And if someone is terrible, and bums people out, try to have them on less. <laughs> have them on less. No, that's great advice because that's a... Uh... And, and hire a booker. Hire a booker. That's meeting like a friend oh. who is interested in producing the show. So you're not, you know, like for instance, Invite Them Up, which I did in New York for a long time, was, you know, booked by Holly Schlesinger, who's now a writer for Bob's, Julie Smith, mm-hmm. who uh, directed uh, the documentary, it started as a joke. She booked the, the weekly show that we did at Union Hall and she booked the festival essentially, okay. I mean, you know, we would collaborate, but I would say like have a, a, a producer. If you have a friend that's a producer and isn't interested in actually being a stand up but wants to mm. do producing and likes the idea of trying to make something fun and popular, you know, that's a great person to work with. Great. Okay. Oh, and side note, did at any point in, in all of this, did you ever use backstage for casting notices? Would it help if I said yes? <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> and I, and I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I in general did the things I did through friends, like in terms of like auditions, like th- there are right. a handful of things. Like, so when I was in New York in the early days, I, I auditioned, I mean, I would audition for lots of commercials and things, but I auditioned for Third mm. Watch and, and got cast. Like I got cast on Third Watch from an audition. I, in general, I don't feel like auditioning was at all my strong suit. Like I, you know, however, like I studied some acting classes and stuff, but like, I'm not okay. like, like in terms of the, th- like in terms of like the things I know that actors who like nail a role and like are off book and their time is mm-hmm. devoted to being excellent at both acting and auditioning, you know? Mm-hmm. 
So, right. so I think for me, like I would do some of that stuff, but, but I remember basically going to a commercial audition and the commercial audition was for, it was a DVD game. So I don't know what year that puts it into, oh. um, but the character that they, the, the, the thing that they were casting was someone who was a cross between Robin Williams and Jack Black. So they wanted like okay. someone who did a ton of voices and then sang yeah. in a ton of different genres. It basically wow. couldn't be like less like my like not my skill set. Like I just like absolutely <laughs> can't do those things unless the joke is someone who does it very badly, which I think like is probably oh. the the direction I tried because there was no other version for me to do. But I think I after I did that, I just realized like I can't. Like I can't take four or five hours of a day to try to do this like gotcha. thing that, that like these random things that, you know, I was much better off trying to think of a funny video that I could right. put on the internet and have people email it to each other. Mm -hmm. So though I did auditions and, and sometimes it would work out, you know, um, mostly that was just not my strong suit. And, and again, I think that the way you succeed is you understand what your strengths and your weaknesses are and where Absolutely. you want to pour in your energy, you know? So like some people are excellent at auditioning and they have kind of the patience and the time and they could mm. be off book for a random thing. They could put on uh, an outfit that matches what they're doing and go to the thing. Um, and, mm. and, and then they should maybe pursue that because that might be their best way of, of succeeding. For me, it just, it just wasn't, it just weren't my strengths and it, was and, and often for me in general, it was easier to make my own thing because that was also a better way of, you know, just becoming a professional comedian. You know, uh -huh. for me, yeah. I found it easier to organize my own night and try to make that popular and try to get press for it than to break into clubs where, mm. you know, could be hit or miss um, in terms of right. like connecting or what they needed and wanted, you know. I just needed to be able to have a career. So it didn't matter to me if, you know, I like I've definitely had places, you know, and, and again, they probably, they were, I don't even know if they were right or wrong, like meaning being like, oh, this is like, I already have like a low energy wordsmith or like I, I need this or that. <laughs> and it's totally fine. Like they need what they need to survive and I need what I need, which was to just start um, my own stuff. Yeah. Kind of finding your own place in the ecosystem and in order to do that it, it take it takes some trial and error yes it definitely takes trial and error but also anything that you can do on your own is just better because you can do it on your own like meaning yeah not 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 like uh i don't mean it like morally i just mean like literally then the power is within your control like i would i never like flyered for random shows but i would hand out flyers for my own shows all the time you know when i was okay. in somerville <laughs> You know, there was, or in Cambridge, you know, when I first graduated from college, I would hand out basically like a thousand flyers every weekend for people to come to my show with friends yeah. um, because I didn't know how to get people to come out. This was also before, obviously, like, you know, any kind of social media. So I would, again, I would try to think of what I could do. And there was like, yeah. you know, I sent out press releases. There was some reviews and then I printed those reviews and made little flyers and then would hand awesome. those things out. And it, you know, would get 20 people, 10 people, 40 people, you know, you, you grow a thing slowly over years. Totally, totally. That's excellent advice. Okay, awesome. Um, and you mentioned the acting classes, which I did want to ask you about. So it sounds like you did have some kind of acting training. Can we call it training? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I'd be the one to call it training, but I won't go sure. like it wasn't training. Uh, yes, I, I definitely took acting classes both in college and then in New York. And, you know, again, I think like, you know, m much of I mean, I've acted in TV shows, but, mm -hmm. but a lot of stuff I've done also is voice acting. And a lot of that also, again, like and even for the TV shows, you know, almost all the characters are that I've played are basically named. Eugene in some way it's true and yeah. sort of our cast with me in mind you know yeah. so I think it's you know a lot of the stuff I've done is basically people who think that I would fit a role mm -hmm. um okay and then ask me to do that role and it it's uh and I like doing it yeah because we on this podcast we ask you know how how did you get here how did you get involved and everyone it really is true that everyone has a completely different path it's also true that everybody has a different process do you have like a set, do you have a character crafting process, especially for VO, 
do you what how do you go about creating a character i so i think the answer is i don't know or i also don't have a process so so meaning <laughs> that's that's like, perfectly fine like like meaning i think with gene like for bobs mm -hmm. which is in a sense the L l most amount of character uh, is is um, a combination of Lauren and me and the writers and everyone, you know, coming together and sort of working to define a character over a period of, period of years. So, you mm -hmm. know, when we were first starting out, you know, there'd be, you know, things that are written, but then, you know, and we recorded basically this eight minute demo for two years or so. So we would go in, we would re-record stuff. We would wow. uh, record what was written. We would improvise stuff. They would give notes, uh, meaning Fox would give notes. And, 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 you know, we'd sort of, it was this collaboration for a period of years back and forth. And I think the things that kind of were warm and funny um, mm -hmm. and maybe odd uh, would sort of stick. And then kind of over time, those idiosyncrasies would become the character, you know? So I think like certain elements of probably, you know, I think Gene was probably like in the beginning, like he had, uh, I think like that little thing that made like robot and fart noises and stuff. And Gene is very into farts, <laughs> but I think he's now also like really into food. So I think like, <laughs> you know, there's okay. just different elements uh, that are brought in over time. And then in terms of, I think, like other characters, often directors have an idea of what they would like. And so for the gotcha. different things I've done, often it's, you know, it isn't as much that I bring a character. It's that I'm cast because there's a thing that they believe that I do that they would like. And then they can tell me what version of it. I was once, I did once audition for something and I forget the show, but they were looking, it was an animated show and they were looking for a Eugene Merman type and I oh didn't get it and can't remember what they wanted. <laughs> so the, so, so that's, and I think I would like, but, like by the time I even, I have no idea, but I also think like, <laughs> it's not even like they first came to me. I think they were looking for a Eugene Merman type, tried a bunch of people and then were like, I guess we should give him a try. <laughs> but there was no like detailed, like I think I might've even done it like, as like almost like a message or recorded it and it might be before you could email. I think I left it as a voicemail, like two different versions. Was it a little flattering to see that? <laughs> It'd be more flattering if they really wanted me. Um, <laughs> so I think it's funny that someone described it, but I don't know what it means. Uh, yeah, I yeah. guess. I guess it's fine. Um, <laughs> but funny. it's only as yeah. flattering as failing. <laughs> totally. <laughs> it's a sign you've made it, but then you also kind of didn't make it in that case. <laughs> yeah, and I think it was also like, this is at a point in time where it was a surprising thing for them to have heard of me. So it was sure. both like, no one knew who sure. I was. They wanted me and also didn't want me. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah, yeah, that's how it goes. Yep. Well, gosh, this is all really great advice. Eugene, thank you. I want to let you go, but can I ask you one last question? Just in terms of advice, we're all about the advice. Sure. If you could go back in time and give yourself, maybe your younger self, one piece of advice, what do you wish you'd known? I don't know. Um, it's it's very hard because I think um, the way I went about things was was like helpful for me. So I don't I don't really. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's so many things that I could have done better, um, but there. But but I don't know that there's like a specific piece of advice other than like just do all that stuff better. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. But that's too broad. Um, I mean, I think that my main advice, not and not as much for me as in general, is like kind of figure out what what you want to do and figure out the things you can do, uh, mm -hmm. like in terms of within your actual capabilities of of doing that, you know. And mm -hmm. I think like and and adjust it as, like for instance, uh, you know, at one point I definitely thought like, oh, if I could get auditions, then that would be a thing. And then I was like, oh, well, this is not at all my right. strong suit. And this is also, it's not even that it's not my strong suit. It's that there's a way to become excellent at right. those things. And if you are the sort of person who has that dedication, you should totally pursue that. And if you're not, figure out what it is that you actually uh, are your strong suits and then totally. push those. Um, so, so I don't know. I mean, I think like, but but it's trial and error. Like I would like part of me is like the things I would tell myself to not do are the things I had to try to see that they aren't like my strengths. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So so I don't know that I would go like, hey, don't go to that audition that kind of made you realize that this is a, a like not going to work out for you in <laughs> this way. 
you know, I think I needed that and I needed to keep doing it. And also at the time, like, you know, you're sort of, you know, you're living check to check and in credit card debt and trying to figure out anything. But then some of those things, it turns out, are are an actual faster way to be able to survive, you know, that, that like going to auditions that are just not really for you and the slight chance that something will click isn't as good of a way to use your time as literally maybe even just working somewhere for those hours or, you know, trying to write a funny thing that you then put out into the world. Amazing. Yeah. The dead ends are actually really informative. They are, you know, that they're dead ends for you, you know, and, and, and things could change and it, you know, a decade later, you might be like, actually, this is now I think that this is what I want to do. I want to focus on, on working in this way. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, it's hard to say it, it, because I think the things that were failures are actually quite helpful to, to help guide you. Um, but but I, I would mostly advise people to figure out what they can have control over and try to do a little more each month, kind of like don't, you know, if you have three days of nothing, but then you do something, you make a video in a week or a month, you know, that's great. You know, if you write a little funny thing, once a week, then by the end of the year, you probably have actually quite a few things. Right, right. So just to get a little closer to your goal is, yeah. is, is my main advice, I guess. That's excellent. That's terrific I, advice. I hope it's helpful. And I'm sorry if it isn't. <laughs> no, that's I'm terribly great. sorry if somebody follows it and a year later, they're like, this was terrible. <laughs> well, then that's one dead end that they can learn from it. It, it really is exactly. trial and error. Yeah. Exactly. It's trial and error. It is a little like science. It's like, yes, there's a science to, yeah, (laughs) career in comedy. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you, Eugene. This is all really, this is great, actionable stuff. I really appreciate it. You're very, very welcome. The voiceover business is more than just acting. It's a business. Voice actors are auditioning, negotiating, engineering, branding, connecting to sessions from home, and doing thousands of things every day to put them in the best position to succeed. So how do you learn about the business of the voiceover business? That part is easy. The Vocation Conference Online, eVocation, September 11th through the 13th. Join experts in the voiceover industry for classes, talks, panels, and forums on the business of the business. For more information and tickets, visit vocationconference.com. John Roberts has voiced everyone's favorite TV mom, Linda Belcher, on the award-winning Bob's Burgers ever since Lauren Bouchard created the animated sitcom around its ensemble cast. A musician as well as comedian, John made a name for himself writing and performing in viral web sketches, including exaggerated impressions of his own mother. Here's our chat with the hilarious John Roberts, and just a quick note for listeners, a few minutes into this, you will hear us edit out a quick break we took to optimize the interview's audio. You are our very backstage at first ever Facebook Live interview. Oh, remember I remember that. that. I do remember <laughs> that. that. I can't, it was yes. a couple of years ago. It's crazy. It was. I yeah. I, in fact, I of the course I would days. love to hear. It was the good old days, and we we talked a, a lot about like making your own work and like the technology that was available to you. We talked a lot about your early career days, and of course, I want to ask you about that again. But I'm. It's almost like so much has changed since. Yeah. Especially just with like. I don't know, a global pandemic keeping us all in, like so much has changed in the last month and a half. Right. Yeah, that'll <laughs> do it. A global pandemic will do it. So how has you, I mean, how has your life changed? How, how are you, uh, how are you doing and how is your career doing? Well, you know, it's, it's been nice to be able to do some Bob stuff because mm-hmm. we are an audio show. So very much like how we're communicating now, we've been doing some Bob's pickups and I have a little studio at home. Um, okay. so that's kind of a natural fit for me. And, um, I've been in the past two years, I've been write, writing a lot of music with, um, mm-hmm. these artists, uh, junior Sanchez, he's kind of a house music guy and, uh, uh, big black Delta kind of indie electronic stuff. And, um, I've made this great video, um, with this artist, Nina McNeely and, um, so that's kind of been put on hold for, for now. Yep. 
Well, looking was Big Black Delta, yeah. Uh-huh. And now Junior Sanchez, um, he's another producer, and we we wrote pretty much a whole album album's cool. worth of material together. So um, it's really fun. Debbie Harry came and did some vocals on a song called Lights Out. That oh was gosh. the last thing we recorded. And um, me and Beth Ditto is going to record as well with me mm-hmm. on a song um, that would be maybe appropriate for um, these times. It's called Dancing in Isolation. So um, <laughs> maybe that would be something we could release and um, we would... Um, all the proceeds would go to food banks um, sure. and uh, make it something positive. And uh, yeah, I mean, really it's, pr- it's pretty good to just do stuff that you can donate to or bring yeah. people's spirits up. There's a lot of great comedians and people still live streaming and doing things mm. like that. Mm. I'm more, I'm more in kind of a quiet creative mode, but I'm sure the comedy stuff will, you know, I'll try mm. to find something <laughs> funny in one of my characters or do do something Mm -hmm. at some point but um for now it's 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 more about um just the medical workers and the the grocery people and all the the people that are suffering and just trying to focus on helping them in Mm -hmm. any way it's keeping busy that's good we we actually we just spoke recently with eugene merman as well Uh it's kind of great that uh bob's is is created and recorded so far in advance that we won't even see episodes that are being worked on now for, for quite a while. Right. Right. They take like eight or nine months to kind of do everything. So, Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's nice that we can still record here and keep the ball going. Um, and, um, the writers are so good. It's, it's, it was nice to get a nice new script and laugh and Mm -hmm. take your mind off stuff for a little while. Um, and yeah. to be working right now is kind of feels very crazy and, and very lucky, fortunate that we, we can continue to keep going. <laughs> so that's not lost at all. And, uh, yeah. Bob's is such a good, fun show. It's, it's so positive and brings yeah. so many people happiness. So it's, it's nice that we can, we can still have that. Totally. Well, in fact, I'm wondering, is Linda Belcher, is she kind of like a, a source of comfort right now? Like, is it nice to kind of go, I don't know if you think of your, of your character in this way, but is it nice to step into her shoes still these days? Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, Linda's, <laughs> Linda's always great. And it's, she's so connected to my mother who I'm pretty yeah. close with. And, and, uh, you know, it's always a source of happiness to play Linda and, um, the writers make it even more so cause they're so good. And, um, it's always just feels like natural and being at home doing it's a little weird, but yes. you know, the fact that we're still able to do it and we, you know, and, uh, interact with, you know, each other, you know, that's, it's really special that we have all this technology now. Um, it's the mm-hmm. one silver lining that we have for one of them. Um, in a lot of ways, all the zooming and things like that. Hey, it's Linda. Right. Wow, rejoining us is Linda. All right. <laughs> I have some tricks up my sleeve here in my home studio. Well, I, I actually was going to ask, so how does the home studio work? How, <laughs> we actually are interested in any advice you have for voiceover actors or yeah. people who are brand new to voiceover. Like what, what goes into creating a voiceover studio right there in your home? Well, I've always had uh, music equipment and um, mm-hmm. um, logic samplers that kind of thing and um i have the apollo twin which is a audio interface and uh it it hooks up right up to your logic and it's a really great interface that you can use you can hook a mic right into it you could it hooks right up to your laptop or they have smaller other ones that are you know maybe less expensive um there's an uh Apogee, I think Apogee. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. the brand. It's a, another microphone that will hook right into your your laptop, and you can have the same effect of microphone and headphones. Mm-hmm. Um, that usually works with GarageBand. And uh, I think I, in terms of me getting into voiceovers, because I wasn't really, uh, I didn't have like a big voiceover agent, and I just kind of stumbled into right. it w- through my characters on YouTube. And uh, my live shows that I created a lot of voices and characters Mm -hmm. um, and developed that way. So um, there's a lot of ways you could go, you know, 
about coming up with dialects or characters and um hmm. you know there's it's really how you're comfortable doing it you know and how you're comfortable yeah. l- learning or expressing yourself and you know I, i'd say there's tiktok now um yeah. you have really cool ways to put yourself out there and be original try to do something outside of the box and um most agents will listen to um someone that has a lot of hits or getting getting a lot of attention it's a good mm-hmm. way to get into the door um which is how i kind of got in through mm-hmm. the youtube videos and um and it was a great way to be cast right lauren is very smart to write for the people that he's cast so it's kind of it's a great way to write a show based on characters and, and people that you know could play the characters and you could see them in your head when you're writing it mm. so that really worked for you know me getting cast in this um because that's well, not everyone does that but i think more people are starting to do that it makes more sense than right. to just write someone that you're not specifically writing for and, and then audition um, a bunch of people yeah 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 or you know write for a type of a person, you know, right mm. specific, right specifically for someone I think is a smarter thing to do. Auditions, I, you know, I'm I'm not really great at auditioning. I don't I don't really audition <laughs> very much and I don't I don't have an agent right now. I don't have um a manager. Mm. Um I'm just re- really doing bobs and making my own connections which has really worked for me um in terms gotcha. of pitching shows and doing that kind of thing. I think people you you find that usually you're the one that's going to make the connections your your agents aren't really gonna do that very much i mean maybe i've just had some bad agents mm. but a lot of people do rely <laughs> on your personal connections and you know you always have to have that be a part of it um mm-hmm. to make s- things happen i think like the best stuff happens through your personal relationships and the agents and sure. managers are there to, to kind of take it from you know there and go but um gotcha. it's at the end of the day i think bobs puts me in a unique position too so i'm lucky in that mm-hmm. sense where i can afford to do that in a sense but i've never been a fan of auditioning um even when i was just struggling and you know always more about making my own product or doing my own thing and putting it out there right. so um not you know not that i haven't auditioned and i've had some good ones i've had some really bad ones um <laughs> but uh, it's not my favorite thing to do right would you say auditioning is a skill it's definitely a skill and and commercial auditioning is especially a skill it's they're yes. two different beasts i would say take a class um there's some great ones that you know for auditioning for commercials and i you know i always had such low self esteem after leaving commercial auditions and really oh, yeah. just like yeah really cuz you're up the night before and you're you know learning these weird lines and then you don't even you know it's just i'm very bad at knowing where to look and there's so many technical <laughs> things that you have to do in commercials and i always just felt like a mess um like how am i going to sell anything so but I think I booked one one or two commercials. <laughs> okay. And they pay so well that obviously yes. you want to book a commercial. So Gotcha. It was worth the investment in in the class and in the endless auditions. Yeah, it's a, everything's a learning process. You're not, you know, they're sure. they're, you know, saying they're gonna pay you a lot of money to do stuff. Um in acting. They're they're so it's so hard to make money. And, you know, so of course, <laughs> you know, but at, at some point you have to decide if you're really cut out for it, you know. I think I'm way better for theater and live stuff. Gotcha. And uh, it's taken me a long time to kind of figure that out. I see. Yeah. So, I mean, take us back to the, because I know that in those early days, the commercial auditions were part of like a a tapestry of what kind of survival gigs did you have? What kind of, um, where were you doing stand up? And like, what was the goal? So for me, I, I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts a really mm-hmm. long time ago. Um, <laughs> by the time I graduated, I wasn't performing anymore. They had a rule there that you couldn't perform, which didn't make any sense to me. Um, mm-hmm. And I was doing stand-up from the time I was like 16, even in New York City and uh, clubs like Stand Up New York and the Comic Strip. And at I took 16. a class at New School. Yeah, I was very ambitious. And and they kind mm-hmm. of like, <laughs> they kind of put a stop to that in a way. 
I was just kind of not really into the environment when I graduated. I was still not really in total, total comfortable. I wasn't totally comfortable with myself. Mm. I was still not out of the closet. So none of the roles that I was reading for, I could relate to in an honest way. So there was that problem. And, you know, at that time, you really had to go around with your head shot. Um, There were soap operas you could go out for, which I knew I was never going to be a part of a soap opera. It was, (laughs) it was very uh, hard for me to, you know, I really had to find myself um, to mm-hmm. get back into entertainment because I just really kind of, you know, didn't do any auditioning, no acting. I mostly made music at home on samplers mm-hmm. and never shared any of that with anybody. <laughs> I became oh. in- introverted in a, in a lot of ways. And uh, mm-hmm. it wasn't until like, yeah, the late nineties, I started to do stand up again and, and create these characters that led to Bob's. And that was, doing um, a show in the East Village um, around 2002. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was called Poo Poo Platter. <laughs> and it was with um, some really great people. We all did characters and uh, I developed prior to that, all my my characters. I had kind of this one man show with all my wigs and <laughs> I would just go through all the wigs and do all the characters. And uh, that was great at Star. It was Starlight Lounge on Avenue A in the East Village, mm-hmm. and um, there was really like a two dollar cover charge, and I could also DJ that night, and I, I really felt comfortable there. Um, it was a nice mix mm-hmm. of everyone, but it was an honest audience. You really had to work for the laughter, mm-hmm. um, and it really made me get better just performing in front of people. Gotcha. Um, and now, you know, if you can't, you know, if you want to live stream a show, I think even just that pressure of being up in front of people, are you going to do things that you didn't do if you're if you're alone, or you know, it's the adrenaline and the thinking on your feet that are going to make you yeah. advance and become mm-hmm. better. So that really helped a lot. And um, then I got a, then I got a manager and started to headline more comedy places like Comics when when that was on 14th Street. That was a great place and um, doing some really great shows there and um, started to develop pilots. I wrote one with gotcha. Bob Odenkirk for MTV and um, hmm. Michael Showalter directed it and it was great. It just didn't get picked up at the end of the day, which um, was a big disappointment. Um, yeah. And then Bob's kind of swept in and that took off, which was really, you know, it's always the thing that you don't see coming. Yeah. And I was glad I, I just kept working and, and doing stuff and and performing and being seen is always a big, big thing. The, the community, the comedy community has really grown also from when I was just getting out of the academy to now. There was no real like UCB mm-hmm. or any of those uh, comedy scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, they were much more baby boomer and adult, like uptown and kind of corny. Oh. Uh, it wasn't like a fun underground indie kind of thing. Gotcha. That okay. didn't really get started until like 2001, 2002 with UCB and those theaters um, mm. that are great, like Groundlings. Um, I, mean, I don't know what right. they're gonna, what's gonna happen to them now, but I'm sure there'll be some kind of, you know, yeah. something like that. Yeah, okay, I didn't know that about the, the comedy scene and you you watched it grow and everything you're saying about like finding the, the kind of personal connections that have nothing to do with an agent, like forging those personal connections, it sounds like in the comedy community, that's where that's really crucial, but also really, really fun and doable. Yeah, and it's all it's all it's also a part of growing as a performer and doing shows together. I think that's when those yeah. relationships are really fortified is that there you you you've gone through these fun moments together, the struggle of it all and the and the victories and the comedy and just hanging out and drinking and laughing or or not drinking. Yeah. And, um just, you know, just respecting each other's craft and and watching each other get better. Um and it does become sort of like a family in a way. Um, mm. Comedy people are very good to each other, so it's a mm. it's a nice environment to be in, and came natural to me. Comedy was always kind of the, my go to in right. high school, or um, something that I knew I was good at. Acting mm. was a little more uh, of a challenge, even though I was I felt good by the time I graduated. Um, acting on camera is a whole nother thing. Um, so voiceover really was the perfect job that kind of found me. 
you know, and I kind of found it too. So I think just putting yourself out there and, um, you know, personal connections happen in, you know, networky ways. I'm not very good at networking. So I was very lucky in New York City to be around the people that I was around and, and have the relationships that I, that I did and people that got to see me perform and introduce themselves and just knowing people that way. It's, it's good when people can know you for something and they could say, oh, this guy, you know, he, he does his mom's the Christmas tree or, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's something that people could, you know, it's a way to advance your, your career is just to be known for something. Yeah. Well, can I actually ask about this moment? If, if it was a moment where you went from kind of just creating music by yourself to the more outward facing, all right, I'm going to put my work out there and kind of get into the comedy scene, like with this show at that club, was that you, your own empowered decision to do that? Or was it a little bit like, oh, I've been given this opportunity to do the club and I'm being pushed into the deep end? Or was it like a combination of the two? I think it was it was after 9-11 and I was in LA and I, I moved, I was there for like two years. I tried it out. It was a big disaster. Oh. <laughs> and then I came okay. back to New York and um, just weirdly 9-11 gave me this kind of freedom, like, oh, we're all going to die. I'm going to just try to do everything that I should have already been doing um, wow. while I was probably dealing with my sexuality and <laughs> just growing up. And your 20s mm -hmm. can be a rough, confusing time for everybody. Um, yes. Not even just dealing with sexuality. Your 20s are just, you know, they're, they're a lot. So I was just making up for lost time and... Um, and, it, you know, in high school, I was so known for doing, I did a Pee Wee Herman impersonation and, uh, mm. <laughs> and the talent show. And, um, mm. you know, it, there, these were these kind of moments for me that I had a little bit of like self pride and self worth and in terms yeah. of like, oh, this is what I'm meant to do. And, um, after New York and, you know, just school and stuff, I kind of let it die a little bit, but it didn't really, because I was working on music and exploring that side of myself, which I had never done before. So everything kind of comes full circle. And um, mm. it was just me being like, okay, it's time to either, you know, you carry around these thoughts and these ideas that you're this person. And then, you know, at some point you have to prove it to yourself and, you know, mm. actually make the rest of the world see it. So I got That's an opportunity. Beautiful. Yeah, because my friend owned Starlight, you know, a couple friends owned it, and uh, and they had this beautiful little stage in the back, and uh, it was a perfect perfect space to do it. So mm. it was, you know, uh, it was nerve wracking too because, you know, what if they didn't like you or this or that? But at some point, you just have to get over it and and mm. do it. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. Thank you. That's exactly Thank the you. Kind of inspiration we want on this podcast. Okay, good, um, good, good. <laughs> I didn't realize Bob's ha Bob's happened right after this pilot that was fully mm. written and did not get picked up, which womp is a womp. for anyone who <laughs> for anyone who's which happens a listening, lot. Actually. It happens a lot. It happens it does. probably more often than not, right? Oh yeah, for but sure. What? Who specifically saw specifically your mom character? And was it was it Lauren? Like, did Lauren come to a show? Well, yeah, Lauren um, and Holly Schlesinger, who's also a writer on the mm -hmm. show um there was another bar which was like four blocks away from starlight where eugene <laughs> actually did his show <laughs> and okay. we didn't know each other really because oh. i was more in this alternative kind of queer scene and they were more doing you know straight up like alternative comedy thing that was okay. taking off and um i guess my manager at the time introduced lauren to my stuff with holly because i was doing holly was at huffington post her a little bit mm. and I was doing some little bits for her there and then uh he yeah he saw my character and loved it and wrote something to, for Linda I guess you know mm. something for wrote that character to me which is you just never know when there's some very talented <laughs> other person out there that's admiring you and, and you know going to include you mm. in something I mean it was I think it's it's a little rare, but it seems like it happens a mm. lot in a ways, you know, like just find people to work with and, and people that appreciate you and hopefully they're going to put you in something. <laughs> yeah. And I guess there was never any, I'm wondering about the like, 
the fact that you are a man who was cast as a woman was that was just a total non-issue, right? Like it never came up of like, did Lauren ever think, well, I have to cast a woman as the mom in this story? Or was it like, no, I'm creating this character around John Roberts? Yeah, well, animation it was kind of the perfect storm for me in in that sense, because it was like, there's already been, you know, Bart's played by a girl. Um, yes, you we know, just spoke to um, her too. Oh, yes. And, and also King of the Hill, Pam mm-hmm. Adlin as well, played Bobby. Totally. So it's it's not out of the ordinary at all. And, right. And yeah, it worked with me and John Benjamin, I guess. You know, he just got us together and we... We're, we're magic. <laughs> no, I mean, we're, he he really saw that the, the comedy and just putting us together as well. And the process of, of putting that together, I didn't realize also that it, that was a long process of creating a very short, almost a proof of concept of a pilot episode. Is that right? Yeah. So we were cannibals and um, we recorded like two scenes and that you know, started to build up at Fox and then they kind of were like, oh wait, hmm. do you really want to be cannibals for every, every episode? And then it evolved from there. Okay. And Tina uh, was a boy at first and became Tina. And okay. it is, it's also a good example of um, letting your ideas evolve and not sticking to the first thing that you think of and, and right. really going back in and, and uh, improving things. Like where could this be better? And they, that was, Bob's is a very big uh, example of that, the development and how it all kind of just fell into place in the right way. So can I ask you to describe Linda? <laughs> and like, I would love to hear about how you kind of get into her character. It's, it feels like something you've been doing for so long that maybe you, it's like riding a bicycle. I mean, every time you just slip into her. Yeah, I mean, it's, my mom is from Brooklyn. So I've kind of, we didn't really have that, these Brooklyn accents because we grew up in New Jersey and my mom had this very Brooklyn accent. She still does. And, and it's, uh, something that we kind of, she let me, you know, make, I made fun of her a lot (laughs) and she let me, um, since I was a kid, you know, um, and it's just easy for me to kind of be that person. I, I would just be at like my aunts in Long Island and, watching all the women in the kitchen clean up after a party was my favorite thing. Just listening to everybody mm-hmm. talk and just, you know, they crack me up. They're just, um, <laughs> it's a, it's, they're, they're filled with, you know, they're, they're very loving moms and, um, but they're also tough women at the end of the mm-hmm. day and, uh, they're individuals cool. and, and, you know, uh, Linda's, she's very human to me. So, um, for a cartoon character. Yeah, I think yeah. she's uh, got a lot of layers and the writers have also put on, given her so many gifts and layers and, and things that she does. But she's, at the end of the day, she still makes me laugh, which is a good thing. <laughs> yes, um, okay. Because if, if I were playing this character and being like, oh, this is not really funny anymore, that would be <laughs> terrible. But she's, she's, always, <laughs> she's always making me laugh. I, I don't think that, Lauren would keep doing it if it wasn't funny. You know, I think he's very true to keeping the show. You know, there's a lot of quality control happening. So um, I'm never surprised that the scripts are still good and that we can still tell fun stories with these characters. Yeah. Is there improv on the show? Like it's, I guess it's not quite improv. It, It just feels like, particularly with her, very spontaneous. Is the breaking into song ever like just you or is it all the writing? Yeah, well, um, I think it's both, you know, um, I break out into song a lot (laughs) and, um, it's just, it's a very fun part of her character that she likes to sing and she's, um, you know, so the, there'll be things that I came up with and then things that the writers came up with. Um, so it's, I'm, I'm always down for singing something (laughs) and Lauren knows that. So, um, but I, but I like to try to come up with some funny little songs because, uh, you know, like the, the, the Florida song, like going to Florida, 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 <laughs> like just, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's all very in the car with your mom and she's singing the wrong words to a song or, yes. you know, I mean, my mom would sing like the wrong words to uh, Glorious uh, Stefan, you know, like, come on, shake about it, do it, da, 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 you know, like. 
I don't know, just kind of <laughs> simplifying it a little bit, but still making it fun. It sounds like you have such a love for your, I guess, character or characters. Like, do you do you really think of them as as these kind of presences that make you laugh or you want them to be able to make you laugh? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Even though it's coming from you. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's I when I watch the show, I don't really see or hear myself. So amazing. Um, it's just more Linda because the work is really happening after we record. <laughs> it's like kind of the easiest part of it, um, the directing hmm. and the animation and all that stuff, the timing of it all. That's Lauren's good ear to hear. That's why we kind of record together, and um, you know, it's it's good to uh, there's a rhythm that's happening. So, um, but. Yeah, they they're they're just the, my castmates are great, and they always make me laugh, whether mm. we're recording or we're not recording. Someone's always saying something really funny. That's so great. lucky in that sense. Yeah, we're, they're they're a bunch of funny funny bastards. That's <laughs> <laughs> great. It's just good to. I mean, that's of course it it comes through, and it it doesn't surprise me to hear that. It's cool to hear that Lauren would just you know call it off if it ever stopped being funny. But I don't see that happening. But. Yeah, he's really, I mean, he's a very smart guy. And uh, he, I think it's not, you know, I think we're still in a really good place with this show and the writers and, you know, that that we've got some some years of funny left. Well, gosh, thank you. This is so great. I, ha- I got to ask you the advicey questions, of course, as you sure. know, because we are backstage. And in fact, could you... Um, speak to your early experiences with backstage what did you use us for well uh back in the 1890s um (laughs) you would get this big backstage (laughs) newspaper and yeah you'd circle your auditions and stuff um and you'd get your headshot and your resume and go to an audition i now i'm imagining people send in reels of themselves is that what they do (laughs) <laughs> There's reels. Yeah. I don't even know what to do. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I like, yeah, I'm just not a big auditioner at all. And I, I never right. was. So backstage was always intimidating to me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> to be okay. honest, it was, it was just kind of like, yeah. uh, I'm not, you know, I'm, how am I going to, there's going to be a million people there. I'm not, you know, it's just, <laughs> I get too overwhelmed. So I get, I throw in the towel. I'm bad like that. But, but I think, <laughs> It's good to do. There's definitely been auditions that I've gone on that that didn't go well, but I was still happy that I went because I learned a good yes. lesson. And and yeah. you know, and I I you have to kind of throw yourself out there and throw yourself into these situations as an actor um, if yeah. you really want to get anywhere. I'm pretty lazy, so <laughs> no. <laughs> well, yeah, you do have to put yourself out there. You you do. That's I mean that at the end of the day, that's it's all about the you know the work and all that stuff. It's true. Yeah. You have to keep doing it every day, do something. Do you have a worst audition horror story? <laughs> um, I auditioned for this commercial and they you were supposed to pop and lock, um, uh-huh. which back in the day with break dancing, you popped and locked, you know, that was the thing. But I guess 20 years had gone by and I there was a new pop and lock happening. So it was just <laughs> being like with this group of dancers and everyone was really good. Um, and I also remember just having like really tight pants on. So you never look really cool like a like a break dancer when you have tight pants on. You just look like um like you have stick legs. So oh, it just uh-huh. it was it was just kind of it was physical. It was uh it was you know, it was embarrassing. But uh oh. and then yeah, I I mean every probably every commercial audition was my a bad commercial audition for mm. me. Just uh <laughs> never knowing what was happening. And always feeling really broke and that the commercial was going to somehow, I was going to make all this money and then I had failed. So I wasn't going to make the money and it was going to yeah. be back to waiting tables and uh, doing all the other stuff. But uh, it, 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 was, it was a good lesson to learn that I was just not great at commercials. Yeah, well, I, actually, I really appreciate your candor on that because it's, it's, obviously people talk about feeling bad after an audition, but it's actually, it's good to hear that like, not good to hear. I'm not, I'm not relishing it, but it, you know, it's, I think it's going to be comforting for listeners to hear, like, if you don't feel good about yourself after an audition, that's okay. It's normal. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And there's so much pressure with these auditions. I think the best way to go, at, you know, is just be a little relaxed about it. Know that you're probably not going to get it, but 
sure. make it a learning experience mm -hmm. try to be the best version of yourself you know get rest and all that stuff and um and try to figure mm -hmm. out what the hell's happening <laughs> because <laughs> you might not know and um it's okay you're not the first or last person that's going to feel that way Gosh, I mean, everything you just said about auditions can be applied to life. So that was great advice. Thank you. Sure, sure. <laughs> John, this is so great. Do you have any um, any parting words of wisdom maybe for people who are just starting their career in, you know, comedy, voiceover, just the arts in general? Well, keep your dreams alive. We've got some difficult years coming ahead, but art is definitely yeah. something that's going to make this a better world. So... Mm -hmm. um, don't let that part of you die and, and keep, keep finding ways to tell stories and, and get your voice out there and, and change people's minds through art and good music and theater and all, all that stuff is very important. So dream very big. Don't let mm -hmm. anyone take your dreams away. Don't let anyone tell you no, but know when you're going to be good at something. It's a good thing to kind of keep it in mind is is that maybe you're not going to be good at everything so try to figure out what what it is that you're good at and and go for it ah that was pure gold thank you that's, that's poetry that's all i have <laughs> <laughs>